The Silver Case is a Japanese visual novel adventure game and the debut title of developer Grasshopper Manufacture, released for the Sony PlayStation in 1999. Originally only available in Japan, it would nearly a decade later receive a remastered worldwide release for PC and PlayStation 4. Grasshopper Manufacture began as a crew of five led by auteur game creator Goichi Suda, more commonly known as Suda51. Wanting to distinguish themselves as indie developers but not exactly being financially liquid, it was suggested by their publisher that they create their first game in collaboration with Suda51's previous partner, Human Entertainment. This is why, despite being a new original entity, the Silver Case contains lingering thematic threads from Human Entertainment's previous titles. Suda51 and Grasshopper Manufacturer would eventually make a name for themselves in the US with the release of Killer7, which garnered a cult following even with a generally unfavorable critic response and poor sales. But for a long time, these games would not make it out of Japan. The reasoning was most likely over the daunting task of accurately translating the insurmountable bulk of text. But it was something Suda wanted to see happen. There was even a western port to the Nintendo DS that was nearly complete but had the plug pulled out of similar concerns. At some point around maybe 2015, an art book was released overseas that increased interest in the silver case. By now, Suda51 had many moderately successful titles in the US, and fans were eager to finally experience his seminal work. This led to the Silver Case Remaster, also called the Silver Case Fine God damn it, I'll fucking translate. Not having played the Silver Case in 1999 or understood Japanese apart from the year of it I took in high school and thought I did, I can't speak for what the experience of playing the original is like and how it differs from the one I played. From what I understand, there are elements of gameplay that seem to hinge on your understanding of Japanese, and those parts were altered or rewritten to be localized to English. New story elements were also introduced to make the transition to its sequel feel less like an afterthought. And you know, I don't know if I'm qualified to talk about this game or breach its intimidating web of lore. It's not something I'm an expert on, and if I've learned anything from my research, there are very few who could say that they are. I'm also missing parts of this collective pseudiverse because some of these games never made it here, and probably won't ever make it here. Because uh, despite being an artistic medium, there is seemingly little interest in retro video game preservation, so I'll do my best to impart to you what I think this game is about while being hamstringed by Japan and its uh, scorched earth video game strategies. Uh, how may I help you? Fragmentation. How did you get this number? Leaching. Catabolism. Humification. Mineralization. I told you our business is done. The breakdown of detritus into smaller pieces. There's nothing here for you. Do you understand? Seeping into the- <sighs> I'm gonna be okay, right? Talk to me for like five fucking years and now you don't have anything to say? What about you? We are in this together. I wish you were me. I want to, as best as I can, understand and find value and meaning in this game that I spent an infuriating amount of time getting through. I've been having trouble trying to generalize and condense what the story is down to a brief synopsis, so let's take this step by step because I, I am collecting my thoughts here, I am actively trying to make sense of it. So, the story featured in the Silver Case is broken up into seven chapters or cases. What I would have liked to have had explained to me is that these eight chapters make up about half of the game, because there are two interwoven storylines that you can either alternate between or do what I did and be completely oblivious to them until you think you finally made it through the game. But uh like life, it just it, it just doesn't it just doesn't end. I literally thought, oh so that was it, huh? Wait, why does it say 50%? Did I fuck up? Did I do something wrong? Why am I so stupid? I'm not gonna let them play this game. So the two plot lines are mysteriously named transmitter and placebo. It's I, I don't know if I don't know if this is a thing, but but there is a, a real I don't know what to call it, it an overindulgence of a idiosyncratic titles and subtitles you'd think would make everything easier to follow uh but it doesn't all right Be beginning transmitter case zero colon lunatics 
We are briefed on the game's setting and some of the reoccurring characters. It takes place in a pseudo-cyberpunk Japanese city called Ward 24. It's a city divided into five areas that are rampant with crime and economic disparity. There is a lot that goes over my head with the, the wealth of organization acronyms and what they're affiliated with and what splinter organization answers to what department of what alliance. I was barely keeping up with that, but as far as I understand, in this alternate history of Japan's Kanto region, its government was weakened in such a way that allowed for three non-profit organizations, the FSO, TRO, and CCO, to essentially vie for controlling interest in Ward 24 in a manner similar to a political party, but not. And I think after some alliances, part of these three groups would come to make up departments that, to some shady degree, governed the region. The way this bizarre government would police Ward 24 is through a network of divisions given the umbrella title Administrative Inspection Office. One of these divisions is the Heinous Crime Unit, which is a group of about five or so people, also split into two units, that investigate particularly violent crimes. Everyone in this group is sort of eccentric, or unstable, or just difficult to work with. Imagine just a bunch of brooding weirdos all acting on hunches and getting gut feelings, and the other divisions don't seem to think of them very highly and see them as more of a gang of loose cannons and less as real detectives. It's interesting because this choice is a very Suda51 thing to do. He really enjoys making heroes out of apathetic layabouts. I don't know how well it works in this game, seeing as though it makes a real attempt or at least the realest attempt he's made at being grounded in reality, which is something he is not known for. So there is an odd juxtaposition with this kind of whimsical cast of characters and the sometimes believable situations they are put into. More so in the beginning, things get pretty wacky by the end. So the first person we meet is Tetsugoro Kusabi, a member of the HCU, who is just driving home after presumably a long day of chain smoking and moody inner monologues. When suddenly, a man steps in front of his car. Kusabi does not have enough time to put together that this man is holding a severed head before the man fires a gun at him and runs off. Being concerned about this, he calls for backup, so as a matter of jurisdiction, the backup he has sent is four members of a group called Republic. Republic is a security force that operates from a rival governing faction. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, cause, so you see, the HCU is part of the police department of the administrative inspection office, and Republic is a specialist, near-militarized sort of SWAT team operating out of the public security department. Because there's so much crime in Ward 24, there are often disputes between the two teams. Republic shows up and has their own quirky set of rules in hunting down the shooter, and in another uh, just odd storytelling mechanic. One of the members of Republic is an avatar character of sorts that is supposed to be us. This is the character we name in the beginning and who some of the characters address to give exposition to. The thing is, the format of the game doesn't really require this character to function as a protagonist. He, well, we, you can see me distancing myself from him already. That ain't me! It could be energy. He is not frequently important or impactful to the story. He seems like a mute observer to a story that's happening around him that he has little to no part in. Later materials about this series seem to refer to the game's protagonist as Akira, so that'll just make it easier for me. But back to the events, Republic and Kusabi manage to corral the suspect, who they discover is named Ryo Kazan, into a nearby satellite building called Cauliflower. Akira and the rest of the Republic Republic team finds an unresponsive and strangely behaving survivor named Rumi that an injured team member looks after while Akira goes after Ryu. Uh, unable to pull the trigger because that would be employing agency in the story, Kusabi shows up and shoots Ryu. This causes an argument over the jurisdiction of the case that is interrupted by Rumi pulling a gun on the team and perhaps the ghost of Ryu both Im imploring that killing them will change nothing and that they will be reborn with Kamui, the holy hunter. But she is gunned down by Republic, leaving Kusabi shaken by her ominous last words. While all these events certainly hint at greater machinations to come, what is not explained and potentially would never be explained because I'm not going to pay $14 for the DLC is that this whole chapter is a chain link connecting the end of a game called Moonlight Syndrome and the Silver Case. 
Moonlight Syndrome is the third game in a series that Human Entertainment produced and never brought overseas. It mostly follows a group of high school girls who investigate paranormal activity and urban legends. As I understand it, Moonlight Syndrome was the first game in the series to be entirely directed by Suda51 and ostensibly takes place in an alternate timeline of the Twilight Syndrome canon. In this timeline, a character named Ryo makes a foolish pact with a white-haired demon boy to rescue his sister with whom he harbors an incestuous love for. Unfortunately, making this pact still manages to lead to his sister's death, and you know, not having a great night, he decides to run through the woods brandishing a gun and her severed head. I mean, what else What else are you gonna do? I, I get it. You gotta have something to remember about. For some people, that's a Polaroid. For others, it's this b <laughs> this is where the silver case picks up and I guess ties up the loose ends of Moonlight Syndrome by killing off the remaining characters. I really couldn't say whether or not it's important that you know that. I think I would have preferred to know why he was just running through the night with a severed head, and I'll never know if he had previously referenced any of what he seems to be up to in this game. Do the events of Moonlight Syndrome matter? I have to believe there isn't much that would immediately make this game and its extended universe branded the kill the past series be any less coherent. It's just very odd that the opening of this game is a bookend from a different series that as far as I can tell, aside from those characters being there, doesn't have a greater role in the, the bigger picture of the silver case. This is not an isolated incident either. Many of the other games in this series would carry over iterations of characters that may or may not be the same character or they are in some way altered or memory wiped or some other kind of confusing bullshit. It's really interesting actually that so many games could be made into a backdoor franchise built out of standalone games. I don't know how successfully that works because I'm playing in the first one and I certainly still feel like I'm missing a lot of information. It's at the very least sloppy. Every chapter ends with the title of a New Order song. I don't, I don't know why. That's fun. So that's the end of Lunatics, which leads into Decoy Man. This chapter picks up on our characters two months later. Wait, uh, wait, wait, I, I guess I should have explained what the ending of Lunatics means. So the thing that this game is named after, the Silver Case, was something that happened 20 years before the encounter at Cauliflower and was brought about by the hunting down and imprisoning of a legendary serial killer named Kamui Uehara. This character and his identity and motives are never clearly expressed and details are often contradictory, but what is known is that he was some kind of hitman who killed a number of high-ranking, important people and became catatonic after his capture, and for years was kept in a hospital. So it's awfully strange that 20 years later, these two murderers from a different game are name-dropping him. So two months after Lunatics, Kamui goes missing from his hospital room and a string of murders are left in his wake, and for the rest of the game you will be investigating the Silver Case and a number of other stories that may or may not be associated with the Silver Case. So there are some issues I have with this game's story. One of them is how you receive information. If it doesn't come in a black screen info dump, characters will just matter-of-factly reveal intense plot revelations as though everyone's been privy to this the whole time. It often feels like a stream of consciousness college writing project. And while I certainly intend to be an asshole by saying that, there are parts of it that are clearly unique and interesting, and cover themes not commonly explored in video games, let alone one from the mid-90s. I liked this, for all I could tell, completely ancillary plotline involving cyberbullying, and some of the more just odd character developments like Sumio falling in love with a serial killer. And it all feels so charmingly weird, which is what I feel Suda excels at. The moments where you can see that glimmer of Suda are what make the story enjoyable. Some plot lines that don't really ever link back up to the main story still contribute to an overarching theme of society and the media's relationship with serial killings. Some of these pull from real historic crimes, like the Kobe child murders perpetrated by Seito Sakakibara, who at the age of 14 carried out two uh, brutal and excessive child murders. I, I guess you could I guess you could say child murder in, in general is pretty excessive, but that's what I wrote down apparently. The ensuing media coverage would spark a great deal of panic and political posturing, as well as copycat murders. This is a concept that shows up throughout the Silver Case a, a lot. 
and it's something that is left ambiguous. At multiple points, characters will refer to a crime disease. I, I was never able to discern whether there was a real transmittable crime virus in this world, and the characters are falling prey to it, or if it was just a phrase that members of the HCU throw around, like some kind of statement on the, the imitation and hysteria that can be brought about by high-profile crimes. I mean, the storyline is called Transmitter. I don't know, either I'm not smart enough to get this or I'm reading too much into it. Characters in the story just kind of leave and we frequently cut to scenes of cryptic dialogue. People start shooting each other and revealing themselves to be double agents and it got really hard to follow. It doesn't help that our protagonist doesn't comment on anything or ask for clarification and everybody else speaks matter-of-factly about the case like it makes complete sense to them. Either that or they say something weirdly dismissive and hostile like, fuck off, are you, are you a psycho? Go, I'll shoot you. There is a lot of very salty language in this game, and it's all very stilted and inhuman and like a robot 12 year old wrote it. It's like, I get that y'all are gritty detectives and you're probably not bothered by the occasional F-bomb, but I don't think anybody speaks this way, and uh, it's a little off-putting. I mean, you guys are in a workplace setting here, you can't just be talking to your superiors like this and shit. If you, if you put me in charge, I would definitely be reprimanding a couple of these guys uh, with some some write-ups and some some choice words. I'd, I'd, I'd march right up to them and I'd say, excuse me, sir, do you, do you have any idea? Oh, shit. God damn it. God damn it. Like what? And like what's happening is interesting. Like, all of these ideas are fun ideas to play with, and all these character archetypes that are brought in are fun to play with, but I don't actually care or know much about any of them. There, there's not a great deal of depth to anybody. They just kind of continuously fulfill their trope until they get shot or walk off set. So, presumably because playing through the main storyline penned by Suda51 uh, gets increasingly disorderly, a second writer was brought in to write the placebo storyline. One that is a little more straightforward and while still being comprised of the utter wackiness that is this story, it does spell it out for you more clearly. That doesn't mean it makes more sense or is less absurd, but you at least understand more of why things are happening. It follows a freelance reporter named Tokyo Morishima as he works to find out information on Kamui. This storyline is substantially less interesting to play through, functioning much more linearly as a visual novel. It mostly consists of Tokyo checking his emails, calling his ex, and talking to his turtle. I mean, I guess in a lot of ways that, that mirrors my own life, but I, uh, I, I don't have a turtle, so I, I, I guess he's got the one up on me there. Fucking pr Thankfully, I, I don't know if that's the word, there are a handful of vitally important revelations that come about in these chapters. Ones that, were you to ignore, as I did, would render certain chapters of Transmitter nonsensical. It seems like a shitty move to me that they would have the real story be, be the interesting and complex one, and that's the one that's going to give you the most difficulty because it's going to have the most missing pieces. And then they're going to give you this like really boring second story, but that one's going to make the other one a complete story that to some degree makes sense. There are sparks of inventiveness in these chapters, like Tokyo's awkward attempts at interacting with his ex-girlfriend, the relationship he builds with his bartender, and his intense fixation on his turtle. It's quirky and endearing in a Twin Peaks sort of way, but getting to these moments is an exhausting slog of establishing shots, meaningless filler, extremely painful and it was scaring me, monotonous repetitive conversations. It just keeps f***ing going. It is as endless as my devotion to you, just call me back! I'm waiting! H hello I got new information. Oh, it's you. Yes. Well, go on. Have I interrupted something? No, I was just expecting a call from someone else. Oh. Well, yeah. Who was it? It's, uh, it's a whole thing I don't want to bother you with. Okay, well, we don't just have to talk about that. I mean, if you wanted to. What? You could tell me about it. Really? You you want to hear? Sure, it's clearly bothering you. Okay. So, it started when I met this person. person. Well... Is this an old girlfriend? I mean, I, I, I thought... Oh shit, hang on dude, I have another call. Uh, okay, uh, I'll be here. 
has hold music. That's neat. I'll just, uh, put it right there. A good 80% of this game will function as a visual novel, so you'll be pressing spacebar a whole lot, just making your way through the staggering amount of text. If, if, if you want, you could spice things up by using enter instead, you know, go nuts. You won't come across any dialogue options or branching paths, save for one moment where you are initiated into the HCU by completing a timed 100 question quiz, where there are a few questions concerning the events of the game, but a lot of the questions, and there are 100 of them, uh, will pull from history, science, trivia, and pop culture references from 1998. It's a really odd moment, and made me think the game would turn out much more purposefully silly than it did. And you know, I don't really have an opinion on base visual novel gameplay. People seem to be all about it, uh, just look on Steam, that, that, that there are so many. I bet only like a third of them are about fucking pigeons. It seems cool, not something I'd get uh, into a, a great deal, aside from ones that have caught my attention like Police Knots. And uh, well, no, that's the only other one. I wouldn't disparage the genre for not having much interactivity, given that I am a noted walking simulator apologist. I'm just not learned or experienced enough with them. So I I'm guessing as far as visual novels go, like this is probably all right. Like this is probably how they work. <laughs> Fucking intrepid journalism at its best. So aside from the novel sequences, you are given control of Akira and Tokyo for very brief moments where you move around with a bizarre control scheme reminiscent of old dungeon crawlers like Eye of the Beholder. I'm sure there was a better example I could have used, but that was the first one that came to mind and I'm sticking to it! So yeah, you have this little control wheel thing where you can select a movement, implement, or contact. Having movement selected allows you to slide around to different predetermined points. Some of these points will have a little symbol, meaning that there is something important you need to do there, which could be using the contact option to interact with something or just looking in the right direction to trigger a cutscene. Don't get too excited when you're handed control because you never know when they'll yank it away from you. Oh, cool, it's my time to shine. Let's see what we got. Oh, all right. Okay, I get it, we're low. We're, uh, we're, we're looking for Lady Ike. All right. Back in the saddle again. Let's do this. I can't wait to see. Well, oh, fuck. The implement option is how you use items in conjunction with something in the environment. Realistically, you're only going to use that like twice, so it's easy to forget that it's even an option. At first, I was relieved to be given any agency at all in this game, so I wasn't dismayed by the intense walls of text because I knew eventually I'm gonna get to walk around and push buttons and solve rudimentary puzzles, and it was fine for a while. There's this long stretch near the middle where you just keep going back to the same apartment building like over and uh, and over, and every time you climb the stairs there is an unskippable cutscene, and you just kinda sweep every floor to find the person you're supposed to talk to, and then you go off to something else, and then we end up right back here. This was a real rough patch to work through, and it probably didn't help that I was so frustrated by it that I kept taking breaks to do other things, and then I just come back right to it, right back to the same place. Right back to the same place. Back into my goddamn nightmare. So many faces. This is not to say that there weren't stretches of the game where I was sort of invested and wanted to know where this was going, but if there is one sin that the silver case indulges in throughout every aspect of its being is repetition. Not long after this, there is a sequence where you are exploring a shelter that winds up being very significant to the greater mythos of the series, and it's literally... Uh, it's like you fucking walk through the same area over and over again, and maybe there will be one thing to interact with, one breadcrumb of story as you literally enter the exact same environment. It says you're going into a different room, but th but this is the same room. You can't tell me it's not the same room. Don't fuck with me, man. It's not funny. Uh, but yeah, th there were moments where I was really intrigued by what was going on here and little puzzles that were sort of creative considering the intense limitations of the game, which is important to me and a big reason why I don't just write it off as being a waste of time. I think it's very impressive how sprawling and dense and confusing and weird as shit a story could be told with a newly developing mixed media art medium and a shoestring budget. There is something to be said for the creativity through limitation apparent in the silver case. 
I, I don't think that guy's coming back. I am still on hold. Huh? Oh. The original silver case was built using a presentation system created specifically for this game called Film Window. Not having the time or resources to fill the screen with character models and environmental art, they developed this as a shortcut where they could feature a bunch of smaller assets and little windows that took less time to create and took up less space on the disc. I have no idea if it was intentional or not, but people's character portraits seem to be very inconsistent. When you meet Tokyo in the transmitter storyline, he looks like this, but in placebo he looks like this. That Chiziru seemed to look different every time I saw her. So if that sort of bottom of the barrel scraping nitpick uh, appeals to you, then watch out for that. Aside from the character images, there are also bits of anime and live action video, and even though created out of limitation, it marked a visual style that would see echoes throughout other Grasshopper games. I'm not overly fond of this interface, uh, there's a lot of busy extra nonsense happening in the background that bothers me, like flying words and fractals and shit. It's, uh, it's, like, a, it's like a goddamn yard sale back there. The environments in the segments you- you- the environments in the segments- this is- I fucking suck at this. The environments that you can move through when you have control of your character are super simplistic and just kind of vaguely resemble rooms and hallways. It's like a couple notches above Alone in the Dark. It's exceedingly unnoteworthy. But every once in a while, the game would work up an effective atmosphere that felt dreamlike and creepy, and the art and video clips really contributed to that. And you know, you're probably more susceptible to being affected by this genre the more familiar and attracted to them you are. And this remaster might even look like a newer polished game if it weren't for the clearly much older and compressed video assets. I like the soundtrack a lot, and this version actually has two... version. God damn. The remaster has two versions of the soundtrack. The original version is composed by Masafumi Takada, which alternated between eerie piano pieces and corny 90s unsolved mystery sort of tracks. It's very much a product of its time, but it's still really enjoyable. The second soundtrack features remixes of the original songs by Akira Yamaoka and Erika Ito. And these are all genuinely listenable outside the context of this game. I think they're great. Uh, Akira's tracks add elements of breakbeat and free jazz, while Erika's are a little more down temple. Temple? Down temple. while Erica's are a little more down-tempo and house-oriented. Uh, with one standout exception that, uh, to, to begin with, was pretty fucking weird, so I'm sure she did what she could with it. Her tracks also feature a lot of this one particular formant synth. It's like a boop boop bop 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 It is super weird and off-putting, but I eventually came around to it and now find it charmingly off-putting. They certainly modernize and make great use out of the original compositions. So... <coughs> To sum up, I like the mix of different materials that make up this game, and I don't mind that some of the assets are a little dated, if anything, that just makes it more charming. I could do with a less busy interface, but I mean, that would defeat the purpose of having everything in Windows, and I'd imagine it would be far more boring. I'm not the genius auteur game designer, of course. I'm just, uh... Nothing. I wanted to cry out, but I couldn't. Um, but the music is super cool. I'm, I'm way about that. I'm a big fan of Akira Yamaoka, uh, both the stuff he makes for video games and the stuff he does on his own time. So, uh, glad to hear he's getting work. So really, I, I have very little to criticize on an audio-visual standpoint. Uh, there's one, uh, glaring me right in the face thing that should be addressed, I feel, uh, and that's this. You like that? You like when I do that to you? Do you like when I submit you to this noise? Probably would like it, you fucking weirdo. Well, get ready to hear that a lot. For the, the, the entirety of the, uh, the whole time you're playing this game, you're gonna hear that noise. Anytime there's text on the screen, you're gonna hear that. Know what you're getting into. 
you're gonna hear that noise. You're gonna have to deal with it. I had to deal with it. You know, and you know, using a, a clickety clackety keyboard noise for text, I feel should be secluded to establishing shots of government buildings. <laughs> you know, where it's like Washington, 8, 8 a.m. Uh, maybe not every single fucking word included in the game, but some of them surely. You know, so moving forward, uh, I would suggest you, uh, not do that again this is not my area so i may have no right to say any of this i'm trying to say i get it though like i see the value and the, the reason why this game received a lot of praise especially if i played this when it came out this would be an entirely different story i'd imagine a as it is now i know this is dated I shouldn't even know that because I have no historical reference for this genre, but even I can tell this is- they probably do this better nowadays. I didn't have the most pleasant experience playing the Silver Case. The repetitive nature of the storytelling and gameplay becomes increasingly grating. There are serious issues with how the story is presented. Ignoring the fact that so much supplemental material is required, Suda's narrative is not coherently told, and meanders around not really deciding where it wants to go. I feel like it's tempting to attribute some of the clumsy writing to a stab at surrealism, and maybe that's the case for parts of the game, but not all of them. I see deliberate attempts to say something and include commentary on things, like depicting a group of corporate goons as warped caricatures. That's an odd touch, but I see that it is in service to something, but there are a lot of things that are just unfinished thoughts. The opening moments promise a lot with this feared and fabled serial killer being released and a team of jaded smartasses tasked with taking him down. That could have been compelling and fun, but that idea gets buried under several other stories until it becomes this formless mass of plot lines that keeps doubling down on abstract absurdity until everyone's a clone and they've all been interconnected and working against each other because of some sinister plot involving a corrupt corporation that raises children in a bunker and silver eyes that grant immortality. It's too many things at once. It doesn't just want to be a hard-boiled detective story, it wants to be dystopian, it wants to be half cyberpunk, it wants to be Blade Runner, it wants to be Seven, it wants to be Gattaca, it wants to be Pulp Fiction, it wants to be Bullet Ballet, it wants to be The Game, it wants to be Lost Highway, it wants to be Rainy Dog, it wants to be Sharkskin Man and Peach Hip Girl, it wants to be Pokemon the first movie, it wants to be Tommy, it wants to be A Bug's Life, it wants to be Mulan. At some point, I just started naming movies and I don't really know when that started. It wants to be Videodrome. It wants to be Rush Hour. And to be fair, the guy's got taste. That's where I feel I have a real connection to this game and where I have difficulty being so critical of it, aside from not having a spine, of course. From what I've played of this guy's work, I think he's really interesting. I think he's really inventive and creative and he's got some fun ideas. It's enjoyable seeing where all of that started, but it's still a little premature. This was the first time this guy got to make a game from the ground up and he wanted to do everything at once. There are moments that shine, some of it worked, a lot of it didn't, but this was the raw creativity just fermenting in this guy who had to spend most of his time working on other people's games. It's something I myself, in a far less impressive and interesting way, struggle with in my own creations. I want to filter everything I appreciate in culture through my own prism and hopefully in a way that winds up being meaningful or stimulating. Even while being underwhelmed by the storytelling and gameplay, I appreciate what the Silver Case is, how unique it is, and I am glad I was able to experience it. It truly provided a diverse assortment of reactions in me. Chief among them was confusion, and I appreciate that, because I still want to know what's going on in this series, and it's still fucking frustrating that I can't confidently say I know. If this was just a truly awful experience, I don't think I'd care, but I do. And it's difficult for me to admit when I care about things. Caring about things leads to vulnerability, and then I leave myself open to all sorts of hardships. Are you still there? Hello. Hey, what's up? Uh, hi. Y you left me on hold. About that. What? I just don't think it's working out anymore. W what isn't? This. What is this? Exactly. Why does this hurt? <laughs>